Your trading partner goes, you know what would be fun is if we did deficit push-ups, superset it with blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh my God, that's great. Double the ideas, double the fun, always a good thing. Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. And today's video is about trading partners. Yes, that's right. Are they important? Are they just evil twins that keep us from achieving the real goals we could if somebody was to make the Smith machine slip just a little bit one way. What am I talking about? Training partners are great and they can help you. And this video is the first in a little tiny mini series. We'll shoot the other videos over at some point as to how a training partner can help you, how to use a training partner in the best possible way, how to have a really good arrangement, and also how to have maybe the suboptimal arrangement that you don't want, but you can do less of that, more of the former, and have a really, really good time. So. If you haven't had a training partner before, but you've considered it, and maybe there are some options for you, you may think, well, hold on a sec, what are the advantages of having a training partner? Like, I lift the weights by myself, still yes, and the answer to that is yes. So what are the advantages? Training partner can help you do a few really, really awesome things. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of times, in the deepest parts of contest prep, for example, myself and Jared Feather, IFB Pro, will live in the same place for a while, in the same room even. We share a blanket. Yes, all the jokes, please. We've seen them all before, but shoot them into the comments. We like to train together for many of these reasons, and you may have a reason to train with a training partner that includes these other reasons. So check this out, how a training partner can help. First, what is called scheduling motivation. If you're looking at your schedule next week and you're like, I'm traveling here, extra work at the office here, Valentine's Day. Actually, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow as of this recording. The fuck? Who the who would you talk about? Oh shit, my wife. Ha ha. Don't you worry about when I'm gonna get my wife. What you gonna get your when are you gonna get your girl, Scott? The video guy? You took her to a nice hotel in Vegas, but that wasn't a Valentine's Day, was it? You think she's just supposed to remember all the way through? <laughs> yes. Someone's like, hey, honey, what's your boyfriend getting you for Valentine's Day? She's like, nothing, but he got me something a few days ago. That's going to go great with the girlfriends. Mm, don't care. Noted. In any case, Valentine's Day, whatever. You got a week schedule coming up. If you train alone, it's easy for you to be like, you know... I'm going to skip next week of training, or I'm just going to train two times. You have a training partner, though, and they may be more open to training, and they may be able to provide you with some motivation to be like, hey, look, 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 I know you're busy, but let's get in the gym at least three times, because I'll be there four, and I'd love to have you for at least three of those sessions. You go, God damn it, you know what? All right, fine. And that's great, because that training partner pulls you into the direction of more training. A few months later, when he's got a busy week and you don't, you can pull him back, and the average amount of adherence to the training plan can go up. Next is, of course, the obvious, really the number one perceived reason that training partners are a good thing is intra-workout motivation. I mean, that's the person clapping and getting in your face and getting after it, get you pumped up for sets, congratulate you after, and all that other good stuff. So yes, absolutely, that is a factor. Another factor that many people don't talk about, hilariously and ironically, as I was about to state, is good conversation. If you have a training partner in the gym who you can chat with and it's fun and interesting, gee whiz, it's like going to hang out with your friend every day for an hour. That's awesome. And this is incredibly awesome from the perspective of adherence for the long-term plan. If to you going to the gym means going to the gym alone and you're lonely, you don't talk to anyone and there's other people there and you're like, eh, and you kind of keep to yourself, ah, man, you might not want to be there much or as much and you might fall off the wagon or just go less. But if you're going there with your friend, your buddy, your partner, your pal, and you're having really great conversations all the time, well, gee whiz, you know, you might go tra train to avoid other parts of life. That's how consistent you'll be. Your wife's like, when are we doing movie night? It's been years, you asshole. And you're like, oh yeah, movie night. Yeah, Cheryl. Well, you know, I got a, I got a training session coming up with my friends. So fitness first. I'll see you never. Whoa. And you just get out the door. Strange that you speak like this and you have a weird accent. But nonetheless, it's really good to have a good time during training between sets because it can at the very least keep you coming back. Another one is program troubleshooting. You may not kind of have figured out why you should put squats here or leg presses here or why that combo doesn't work, 
But when you're making a trading plan, usually your training partner's involved. And if even if they're not, you can ask him like, hey, dude, what I think I should do with leg presses today. He's like, you should do them after stuff like those because you don't need your back anymore because you'll just be in a leg press and your back is on a seat. Like, oh, fuck, brilliant. Thank you so much. So program troubleshooting is something a training partner can do really well because not only do they know general theory of training in many cases, but they also know how your body works and how your body is particular to your needs and and how everything gels there. And they've trained with you maybe for weeks, maybe for months, maybe longer, and they really know how you respond so they can give the most apt uh, program advice. Jared and I, when we train, he always gives great programming feedback and, and hopefully vice versa. Another one is idea generation. You may be like, man, you know, like I'm putting together a chest day. I don't feel like we used all these exercises already. Your training partner goes, you know what would be fun is if we did deficit push-ups, superset it with blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh my God, that's great. Double the ideas, double the fun, always a good thing. Another thing is, you get to learn by experimenting. Everything's kind of an A-B split test. If your training partner does one thing and you do another, you basically go, you know, I don't know if we could do these curls or these curls. Your training partner does one, you do the other. A mesocycle later, you come back and you're like, what do you think? And he's like, eh. And you're like, I thought my shit was great. He tries your shit the next meso, you try his. What do you think? Oh uh, yeah, you're right. Your dumbbell curl sucked. And he's like, dude, the the cable curls you had going, they're great. So now you have two people that say this exercise is amazing. Two people that say this exercise sucks. Maybe you learned a lot for the both of you. And look, if you don't agree, then you can say, hey, it's all individual difference. So it's lots of stuff to figure out, uh, to make sense of. And uh, you can do all kinds of little experiments there with your training partner, and you can learn a lot more. And of course, last but not least, and this is one that applies more if your training partner is also friends with you, but even if they're not such close friends with you, is promoting adherence outside of the gym. You know, uh, if you're on your diet game, like you're going to have a discussion about diet with your training partner. And so it, it could look just like this. You show up Monday morning, you both show up to the gym, you start training your legs. And your partner goes, so how's the diet? Right? Because you told him last week you're on a fat loss diet. The fact that you know he's going to ask you is already good motivation for you to not do stupid shit on the weekends. Because then you're going to have to stare your training partner in the face and say, oh man, you know, I actually just ate potato chips all weekend long. Because at the worst, he's going to be like, oh, yeah, I hear you, man. That's fun. No big deal. But then you've like perceptively lost value as a human agent, a rational willpower you know, holding agent. And it just sucks. Uh, most of us want to perceive that we're competent. Most of us want to perceive and uh, be perceived as somebody who sticks to a plan when they lay it out. So even on the bare minimum of him just asking you stuff in the gym just about how life is going, you're going to want to make sure that your diet, your recovery, et cetera, uh, makes a ton of sense. Like if you come in from the gym and you're like, yeah, man, legs are going to be tough today. I just did stupid shit all weekend and didn't get any recovery. There's, your training partner is going to be like thinking at least to himself or to herself, like, you know, I'm in the gym trying to crush my goals. It's nice to have a training partner who's also in the gym to crush their goals. And if you guys have ever been in a situation with you have a training partner and two different degrees of seriousness, they tend to kind of find like, like water finding its level, at least to some extent. And oftentimes that means the degree of seriousness moves up when one of the training partners isn't willing to move down. A lot of times if you train with someone, you know, I'm, I'm trying to train pretty diligently, but when I'm training for um, just with Jared, Jared Feather, IFB Pro, if I'm training with him and he's training for a pro show, there's one speed on, you know? And uh, that was really good for me because I can be very serious in the gym. But if Jared was like some fuck off asshole who was like, eh, I'm gonna do a set, eh, I don't feel like it, then it's kind of like, it is a little tougher for me to, to push my pace. So basically it's one of these things where you end up, if somebody's serious in the gym, it ends up sort of exuding seriousness to the other facets of life and everyone's fitness gets really, really good. And as a matter of fact, people will tell you that. Um, I've actually uh, talked, well, I've talked to numerous people on random occasions about muscle stuff, and I hear a lot of the same stories. And one of the stories I hear is, you know, when people find out I'm a bodybuilder or whatever, they'll say, oh, you know, I used to train with, and they insert a pro's name back in the day. And a lot of times they say, man, I was in the best shape of my life when I trained with that guy. And it wasn't because the guy knew a whole lot of secrets or something. It was like, this is a pro. When we go in, we go hard, and we go consistent. And if you can train with someone at a higher level, a training partner that pulls you up and you pull them up, hey, that's awesome. It's going to be great for the rest of your life as well. Second thing, okay, so first, how can a training partner help? Second is what makes a good training partner. And concomitantly, what makes a bad training partner, that stuff we will cover next time. So, but I suppose the opposite of this at the very least. First, what makes a good training partner is they're, they're on time, non-negotiable. I've been a training partner that's been like five to 10 minutes late. 
Not a fun feeling. Not one I want to feel again. So nowadays, I make sure I'm on time every time. And if you have a training partner that's five to 10 minutes late, it's like some combination of funny joke slash nuisance. If you have a training partner that's half an hour, 45 minutes late, or they just don't show up, that's not really your training partner in any sense of the word. So on-time training partner, critical. Diligent. Okay, they don't miss workouts willy-nilly. They don't miss reps willy-nilly. They don't get their technique off. Like it, one of the weirdest things you can have with a training partner is you go, both understand what good technique is. And then they're doing lap pull downs. And at the end of their really good technique lap pull down sets, they start like herky jerking and they get like three more reps. Like it's always weird for me to broach that. Be like, the fuck just happened, bro? Did you just forget all the fucking sports science knowledge that we're trying to learn together? Fuck are you doing? That is an example of low diligence. Like somebody who could stick to a plan and a program. I mean, gee whiz, you know, like that's what you're doing with your training partners just to get into a plan. So if they're low on diligence, the whole thing is kind of uh, up, up, uh, up to no good. Third, there is a nuance here, but the, it's leaves drama at home. Leaves drama at home doesn't mean that between sets of leg curls, it's something wrong with your training partner. Be like, well, Cynthia says she wants to start seeing other people. But if I wear a mask and I'm on her OnlyFans, that I can be in the room at the same time. You're like, fuck, bro. Or great. I don't know. What is the monetization on that OnlyFans? I'm trying to, you take this, you giving yourself a little sniff, a little piece, a little slice. Or is it just, are you just in like a fucking gimp mask? Huh? That's cool. But if instead of spotting you on leg press uh, to make sure you don't die or watching for your technique or even just chatting with you between sets, if they're on their phone, they're like, Cynthia, if you ever text me back, I will hire the mafia, send, dot, 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 to have you fucking killed, send, dot, 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 black heart, black heart, black heart, black heart, send. We're here to train, bro. Either train or chill between sets. And if we're bringing negative energy and drama and a ton of like really spastic shit, eh, it's okay every now and again. But generally speaking, like, same applies to all sports. You can actually treat this all as teammates in basketball or football. Somebody bringing drama on the court? Weird. Drama on the bench? Whatever. Next, training partner has to bring the right intensity, which just means a sufficiently high level of intensity to get going, but also nothing psychotic. Like if your training partner starts warming up for the squat and he's yelling at every rep, you got to be like, bro, 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 bro. People know me in this gym. Also, if they don't, they soon will as the guy who works out with yelling insane asshole guy you shut the fuck up. Like there's levels to the shit. So you have to have an intensity that's like, go hard when the time is right, chill when the time is right. Next gives you what I like to call Goldilocks level of encouragement. You don't want a training partner that you're warming up for a set. He's like, come on, buddy, you got this. Or, of course I fucking got this warm up. Chill the fuck out. Right. Or every single set, he says the same shit. It's kind of annoying, but you also don't want to have a, a training partner where you just hit your all time best PR on bench. You rack, you're like, fuck yes. And training partner's like, Okay, it's my, my set next. Ready to spot me? You're like, okay. Jesus Christ. Or you're like grinding out a leg press set and your training partner's like, you finally get it? He's like, good job. You did it. And you're like, are you a fucking robot? And there's going to be some, some living human in there, but not so living and so alive that, that too much of that like guy that came to talk to your high school was a motivational speaker shit. And that's like excessive. So somewhere with it, especially where you like, where you guys can gel. And most people who have a decent amount of uh, eh, social intelligence, if there is such a thing, to perceive cues and, and get on the same level with that stuff. Next, big one. A training partner has to give you honest feedback. If you're doing terrible technique, if you're not getting the reps, but you say you are, your good training partner shouldn't be like, good job, bro. And then it's his next set. Or like all you when it's not all you. I don't want that shit. I want honest feedback. Now, Luckily, my training partner is often Jared Feather, IFB Pro. He's a mean man. Jared's a mean person. And, well, okay, honestly, he's one of the nicest people in the world. But to his friends, he's really mean. I don't know. He has a rationalization for it. If I fuck up a tiny bit, I get the inevitable, the, the, the doom saying, the shh, earth quakes, the mountains crumble, the seas boil, and I hear a, come on, Mike. And I know with that stupid Missouri accent, I did something wrong. My toes came up, my heels came up, I wiggled the bar this way or that way. Jared keeps me honest. Because honesty doesn't mean being a dick, and he's not a dick. Honesty means being like, dude, that was a great set. 
And then when it wasn't, be like, oof, that got rough towards the end. Even gentle honesty like that, it'd be like, respect, it got rough, I'm gonna clean it up. Next time, you have a good set. That's what it's all about. Next is your training partner shouldn't compete directly with you. When Jared and I are training together, I count the number of reps that he does so I can say things like two more. And I usually get it wrong anyway because I'm barely counting. I'm not counting the number of reps he does to be like, I'm going to do two more than him. First of all, if he's on contest prep, yeah, I'm stronger. If he's on mass phase and I'm on prep, he's stronger. Who the fuck has time to compare that kind of shit? There is individual differences in how fatigued you are in each exercise. We're all just trying to hit our own reps in reserve to our own specific strength on that exercise. So if a training partner is ruthlessly competitive, like if you have a guy that always has to get one more rep than you, that's an insane person, not a training partner. So competitive is great, but like directly with you competitive is nuts. Compete more on how good your technique is. And honestly, between training partners, I wouldn't even compete. I would be on the same team. Like, do you compete with guys on the same basketball team? Like in practice, kind of, if that's the drill. Do you do it on, on, in, in, the, in the actual game? Because remember, training partners, their training is their competition, right? You being in that gym floor of a 24-hour fitness in you know West Oaks, LA suburb or whatever, that is your fucking game time. It's you and your training partner, 40s a week, are fucking like the Lakers and the Pistons, right? Sorry, so the analogy wrong. You're like, ooh, I was going to use Kobe and Shaq, and then I realized they hated each other. Oh, king A. Jordan and Pippen, I'll go back on some old school shit. Actually, people who are not competing against each other, but they're collaborating. So the com direct competition, even indirect competition is kind of weird. They're all there on part of the same team. Next, you want a training partner that is honest about their own preparedness. What you don't want is week five of the mesocycle. You guys are both trashed. You should be deloading. And you got this like weird, again, competitive bro complex where he's like, how you feeling, bro? And you're like, can't barely open your mouth because you're so fatigued. You're like, good, good, man. I feel good. Uh, fuck, great. And he's like, yeah, me too, bro. Uh, me too. And you're like, uh, let's warm up. Yeah, great. And you do another shitty workout where both of you suck because nobody can just admit that they have high fatigue. You don't want a, a training partner that drags you down because he's a straight fucking bitch. But like, you got to have some wiggle room of honesty. Honesty about preparedness. Honesty about everything. Because the, at the end, you want the truth so you can make the best decision possible. Uh, when training partners lie to each other, it's kind of fucking weird, whatever the reason is. This one, the next one is related. Uh, somebody that doesn't bitch aimlessly. Only from the perspective that aimless bitching, it, bitching with aim is like, hey, this is a problem, let's solve it. Solving, great, no more bitching. Aimless bitching is some, it, 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 bitching can be fun. If it's comedic and humorous, hilarious right? Uh, one of our, our training partners and very good friends, uh, someone who's appeared on this channel a bunch for training, uh, world record powerlifter Brianni Terry, she says, I'll, I'll do every set, I'll do every rep, I'll try hard, but I absolutely reserve the right to bitch, to which I answered, girl, I'm Jewish, you don't think we invented that shit? Fuck up out of here, right? But it's totally valid, bitching is hilarious and can be awesome, but breeze bitching is fake bitching, it's joke bitching, it's athlete bitching. For real bitching, like, man, fuck this exercise, I want to do this shit. And you're like, okay, are you sure? They're like, oh man, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You're like, bro, like, stay calm. A lot of people are just complain about a lot of stuff, and complaining is just toxic. Real for real complaining. Joke complaining is hilarious. So, if you got a training partner that's just fucking complaining all the time, ah oh, man, you know, you kind of picked the wrong training partner, maybe, or at least, at least worth a discussion. Next one is someone you can chat between sets with. Now, this isn't mandatory. None of these are mandatory, mandatory. Some of them are highly recommended. You can have like a silent relationship. Like when Batman and Robin drive back to the Batcave after a day of fighting crime, I don't know if they're like, so go to that gala tomorrow as Bruce Wayne. Batman's like, yeah. All right. You gonna you fuck any of them hoes there? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, my man. Anyone uh, looking out for? Yeah, this one bitch, Cindy. You're like, ah, oh, sweet, my man. Hell yeah, fuck Cindy. Let's get it. I don't know if that happens. And you just kind of sit there, right? And that's totally cool if you want to be Batman and Robin about the shit. Between sets, you don't say anything. But it's just much more fun if you can bullshit between sets. So if you can have like a friendship as well as a training partner thing, all the motivational stuff, the consistency, the adherence, all that just gets way, way, way better. Next, a training partner should ideally, this is not a must, be close to your weight and height and honestly, your strength. Why? Because 
if my training partner puts one plate on the leg press and I put seven on the leg press, or if I put seven and they put 12, that's a lot of work for both of us. If my training partner is six foot eight and I am five foot three and a half, which is my real height, I love starting rumors on the internet, Scott the Video Guy. Guys, but for real, my real height is 5'2 and a quarter. But honestly, it's 5'6. But on a serious note, I'm actually 5'9. Yeah, ooh. You didn't even mention that Jared training. Training for muscle growth is never going to be the same. My... Training partner, Jared Feather, everyone knows, fact, is my biological child. He came out of my penis. Is that, that's how children work? No, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's ideally the thing for you to be roughly the same size, strength, et cetera, so you can work on the same machines. Okay. So if I'm 5'3 and the training partner 6'8, what fucking squat height are we racking out into and out of? Are you fucking kidding me? Like... Okay, I'm not doing pull-ups here on your fucking squat bar, and I don't want my training partner to have to do a full ROM good morning to stand up with my squat. So at the end of the day, it's not a must, but somebody roughly similar size, similar strength isn't super important as long as they're not like outlandishly stronger. Like if I'm benching a plate and you're benching two, shit, no problem. If I'm benching a plate and you're benching three, no problem. Two plates on, two plates off, no big deal. But again, if I'm hack squatting one plate and you're hack squatting eight plates, Fucking Christ, who's going to put seven plates on the bar each time between each set? That's nonsense. And you reach another problem. If somebody's really, really strong, if someone's really, really not strong, I don't like to use the term weak, all the time it's kind of negative. Um, you know, the person who's not as strong, they need like 30 seconds break between uh, sets. The person who's really strong needs three or four minutes. And then it's like, does that person do two sets for the one? They're going to run out of stuff to do. It's better to have things similar. Not mandatory, but better. And lastly, has similar goals. And this one's pretty important because if one of the training partners is training for powerlifting, the other for bodybuilding, one is trying to work on his chest, the other one's trying to work on his arms, it's tough because then you have to do, go separate ways for a bunch of different exercises. And then you're just kind of going to the gym uh, to train and, um, you know, you're not training for the same thing anymore. Like my wife and I are similar enough height for the height thing to be okay uh, different enough strength for that to get annoying sometimes. But a lot of the things like we train for considerably different goals within context, like what we're specializing, prioritizing, et cetera. So when people are like, oh, like do you and your wife train together? I'm like, well, we're in the gym at the same time. I stare at her ass a lot. But is it true for me to say that I train with her? Like, eh. sometimes when we go on vacation and we just do like a general program for sure. It's fun to have my little bro training partner. My favorite thing is to say all kinds of bro jokes with her and treat her like a man. And then later we go into the locker room. We discover she is not a man. And then happiness, confusion, tears, more happiness, confusion, tears. And then we leave the locker room. That's just in the locker room, all that stuff, by the way. So in any case, similar goals is really, really helpful. Now, the last thing for... Uh, this episode today is what doesn't matter, and that is experience level. You can actually have great training, someone who's advanced with someone who's a beginner. There's going to be a lot of learning, but that beginner is going to come up real quick to be able to help that advanced person out. Spotting and loading, looking for basic technique stuff. Even if you have a beginner in training, a lot of times what you do is you put yourself into this position with the way you describe technique to them. After a few weeks, they become a technique zealot, and then they just innocently tell you you're doing shit wrong, and you're like, wow, fuck, he's calling me out. He's totally right. For example, as an advanced person, when you have a beginner with you, you teach him how to bent row, you're like, all right, like do this, do that, make sure your back never moves, no body English. They're like, okay, got it. And the first they suck at it, and a couple weeks later, they're doing it pretty good. And then they're spotting you, and you know, it's all good, vice versa. And they're like, hey, on that last set, you're, you're, you know, your back's starting to get a little wobbly. And the instant inclination I usually have is be like, the fuck? I birthed you into this world of training. How dare you? <laughs> I'll birth you back. Uh, but the reality is you got to be like, oh, word up. Yeah, uh, listen, if I can't convince a beginner I have good technique, I'm really fucking up. So a lot of times that works really, really, really well. So it doesn't have to be that you have the same experience level, but all these other things are highly preferred. Next time, when we come back with another one of these videos, hopefully we'll link this one to that one so you can be caught up. We are going to talk about training partner negatives and how to get the most out of your training partner, including hacking into their bank accounts and just, just a small enough money to where they never see it, leave the account, but big enough that you can buy extra burritos and uh, fuck over your friends on the slide. Not friends, training partners, big difference. See you guys next time.